In this video, I give a simple introduction to finite impulse response filters, also known as FIR filters, which are used for filtering time series data. And I also show and explain how you can design an FIR filter using simple open source tools. FIR filters are pretty common, and you can find diagrams like this on Wikipedia. However, when I looked on YouTube trying to find a simple video to explain the concept to a student, I was surprised that I couldn't find any that didn't require a fair amount of signal processing experience. So I decided to make this video. Knowledge of FIR filters, as well as other types of filters, used to be mandatory at many engineering schools such as MIT, using classic textbooks such as this one by William Siebert. But unfortunately, because of the advent of AI and machine learning, there are many undergrads that have never been exposed to this material, which is a shame because filtering can help improve the performance of AI models. In a typical application, you can imagine some sort of signal that is a function of time. In the biomedical context, this could be a pulse waveform, for example. And this waveform has some higher frequency noise on it, as you can see here. Now, to eliminate this noise, we can examine the nature of this noise further by viewing the frequency spectrum of this noise. And this can be done by transforming the time domain signal to a frequency domain signal using tools such as a Fourier transform. Then, using this idealized example, if this is a pulse waveform, we would expect to see a frequency peak corresponding to the heart rate. And then since the heart rate is coupled to the breathing rate, we might see a lower frequency peak for the breathing rate. And then we see the unwanted peak that corresponds to the noise that we want to remove. So what we would like to create is a system function or a filter, such as the curve that's shown at the bottom here, which preserves the portions of the signals that we want but yet attenuates or blocks the portions of the signals that we don't want. And I should also mention that although these waveforms seem like continuous signals, they are actually comprised of a time series or a sequence of sampled signals. So the signals that we're discussing here are actually a time series. In order to convert the continuous time domain signal to the frequency domain, we often use the Fourier transform. Some of you may be familiar with the more general Laplace transform, which is sometimes used in differential equations. But since we're talking about discrete time series, we are going to be using the time series discrete versions of that. Instead of using the more general Z transform, we often use the DFT or discrete Fourier transform. But I'd also like to point out the FFT, or Fast Fourier Transform, which is a very clever algorithm that runs very fast, which is often used to generate the frequency spectrum in near real time. Now, getting back to the FIR filter, you have a sequence of points coming in, we'll call those the X sub n, and you have the filtered output, we'll call that Y sub n, coming out at the other end. And you can see in between, we have the time series that are separated by these time delays. Several successive time delays are added together, and then that is used to produce the filtered output. Now to demonstrate how this works, I have drawn a filter on a separate sheet of paper, and this particular filter has eight taps, which are designated by these eight circles and eight coefficients, zero through seven. And as you can see, that each data point in the original signal is multiplied times the coefficient and then added together to produce the filtered output, y sub n. Now, the number of coefficients or the number of taps that you have will depend on the complexity of your filter. Then, to get the next point in the output, y sub n, we simply shift our filter along to the next data point and repeat the process. So as you can see, this filter sort of moves along like this, and each step 
is outputting and calculating a new filtered output data point. Now, as you can see, you need to be a little bit careful both at the beginning and at the end of the output sequence because you're going to be missing some data. So in that case, you can fill in the missing values with, for example, the running average of the input data points. So as you can see, the FIR filter is actually quite simple in principle. It's also pretty easy to code. The only challenge that really remains is to solve for these coefficients, b sub n, and figure out also how many taps you need depending on the filter that you want to build. There are various ways to calculate that by hand, but probably the simplest is just to use one of the online tools, which I'll show you next. One of the most common online tools for FIR filter design is called T-Filter, which has been around for many years. You can either go to this URL or you can just Google T-Filter. When you go to the website, you will essentially see a frequency domain or frequency response plot of the filter that you want to design. In this case, this frequency response is a low-pass filter, which corresponds to the sample plot that I showed earlier. The x-axis is frequency, and the y-axis is a logarithm of the amplitude. And this is generally in units of dB. So 0 basically corresponds to unity, so there is no attenuation. And then these units here, you generally divide by 10, and then raise 10 to that power. So for example, minus 40 dB is basically 10 to the minus 4 is an attenuation that you get in your stop band. So you have the pass band and you have the stop band. In this case, since we are talking about a heart rate, which is a fairly low frequency signal, we are showing here frequency from 0 to 30 hertz. And I am assuming a sampling frequency of 60 Hertz. And this is typical for, let's say, some type of wearable device or wearable electronics that has a relatively low sampling frequency. So as shown in the plot, we are attenuating all frequencies between 15 Hertz and 30 Hertz. That is designated as our stop band. And then for our pass band, it is from 0 Hertz to 10 Hertz and that is where we want to have minimal distortion of the signal. As you can see, the signal is not perfectly flat in the passband, and that is called the ripple. And this design tool lets you define how much ripple you want in your passband. So if you look down below, here you enter your sampling frequency, which is 60 hertz, and then you can define the two segments or two regions of your frequency response. You have your pass band, which is 0 to 10 hertz, and your stop band, which is 15 to 30 hertz. In your filter design specifications down below, you can also specify how much attenuation you want to have in your stop band and how much ripple you want to allow in your pass band. But you should keep in mind that if you allow only a very little amount of ripple, or if you ask for a lot more attenuation, it will generally result in a more complicated filter with a lot more taps. Now first I would like to mention a couple basic things about entering in these parameters. For those of you who are familiar with the Nyquist rate, I want to say that the frequency range here is limited to half of the sampling frequency. So if you need to go to a higher frequency and want to define your filter for higher frequencies, you should resample your data so that the sampling rate can be higher. So as you can see here, since my sampling rate is 60, the frequency region over which I can define my filter goes from 0 to 30. The other thing which I will mention, which is very important, is that you will notice that there is a gap between the pass band and the stop band. The pass band goes from 0 to 10, and the stop band goes from 
15 to 30. And the reason for that is you need this gap to allow for this transition. In the real world, it is not possible to have a step function transition such as I drew in the ideal filter that I gave at the example at the start of this video. And you will notice that the shorter you make this transition, the more complicated your filter will be. So if you want a simple filter without too many taps, you want to leave a generous gap between your pass band and your stop band. So once you have entered in the parameters that you want, you then just click on the button design filter, which I did already and it drew this filter. And if you look down below, it tells you the number of taps that was used to construct this filter. So in this case, we have 15. And if you look at the upper right of the screen, it will show you the values. These are the coefficients for each of the 15 taps. Now what you see here are integers. So this is assuming that all the values in your signal in your time series are integers. And you could specify the number of bits in this window right here. But if you want to use floats, you can simply change that right here. Instead of integer, you can specify double precision, and then it will give you the float value that you can enter in for your taps. So as you can see, this tool is pretty easy to use, and it's a nice graphical interface. This is the free version of the tool. Um, the paid version lets you do more complicated filters that have many more taps, and also lets you design other types of filters. But even this free version is quite useful for most applications. I hope this video has given you a basic understanding of what an FIR filter is, and also how to design and implement your own FIR filter using one of the free online tools that are available. Thanks for watching.